And good evening to everybody. Um, you're very welcome to this event here. Thank you very much for coming. We're just, I think we're about to go. I'm uh, Dara Fitzgerald. I'm the Executive Director of the Fulbright Commission in Ireland. Um, I'm sure most of you have met me at some stage, maybe at interview or past that stage. I'm going to act as uh, MC for tonight. And part of that uh, role then, uh, just asks, uh, it requires me to uh, ask you a few things. One is to um, please keep your masks on when seated um, and when moving around. Um, you, obviously, if you're eating or drinking, um, you, you, could, you can obviously remove your mask, or if you have a specialised mask, then I presume you could operate through that. Um, <laughs> the other thing I would say to you then is, uh, actually, there's probably, is, uh, there's probably money to be made in that. Um, the other thing was, uh, you know, we're, we're still very social media focused. You know, and there's a smaller group here, obviously, but there are people beyond this who are who are very interested in what we're doing and uh, being and couldn't be here tonight. So, can I ask you to please, uh, you know, if you can engage with social media and use the hashtags? I'm going to say hashtag Fulbright75 and hashtag Fulbright IRL64. So the second one was Fulbright IRL64. Now, so really to kick off then the, the, the proper part of, of, of this event, um, I, I just put out a message today and I realised it's our first in-person event this decade, which is ast it's astonishing for Fulbright. Um, so it leads me to introduce then our actual host for tonight. And this is um, Alexandra McKnight. And Alexandra is the Chargé d'Affaires at the US Embassy here in Dublin. And I'm delighted um, that, uh, and thankful that Alexandra um, was able to host us for tonight for our first, um, hopefully we won't have to wait too long uh, before we get to, uh, to be hosted again. Um, Alexandra, uh, she assumed her duties as Chargé in January uh, 2021, and she has served um, in multiple countries, including Spain, Malta, and Portugal, and I, I know you mentioned uh, a, a whole host of other countries um, today at lunch. Um, she is our host for tonight, and uh, at this point, I'd like to invite Alexander to come up to address us. Thank you. Thanks, Dara, for that kind introduction. First event in this decade, wow. Uh, colleagues and friends, it is truly a pleasure to host the Fulbright Commission and the Department of Foreign Affairs this evening to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright Program. Since the pandemic, we have obviously had precious few opportunities to have cultural gatherings here at Deerfield. But this special setting feels fitting for both a landmark program and a milestone achievement. 75 years of deepening international bonds, historic scholarship, and the creation of countless global citizens. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Commission staff, the board, our sponsors, and our partners in the Irish government for your continuing commitment to this incredible program. 75 years ago, Senator J. William Fulbright challenged his colleagues. We must dare to think unthinkable thoughts, he said. We must learn to explore all the options and possibilities that confront us in a complex and rapidly changing world. The resulting program, which of course bears his name, has gone on to become the gold standard of international exchange and the flagship international educational program sponsored by the US government. Since its beginning, more than 360,000 Fulbrighters have participated in the program. And since its establishment in Ireland in 1957, the Fulbright Program has played an essential role in further strengthening what's already a very special relationship between the United States and Ireland. Along the way, it has helped to build lasting educational ties and deep mutual understanding between our nations. Each year, the Fulbright Commission in Ireland grants awards for Irish citizens to study, research, or teach in the United States, and for the United States citizens to do the same in Ireland. And since its formation, more than 3,000 postgraduate students, scholars, professionals, and teachers have participated. And the Fulbright alumni are incredibly impressive, including 39 current or former heads of state, 60 Nobel laureates, 89 Pulitzer Prize winners, and 75 MacArthur Foundation fellows thousands of leaders across the private, 
public and nonprofit sectors are Fulbright alumni. That's a pretty amazing record, and it's certainly a club that I would be proud to be part of. This evening, we are fortunate to hear from a panel of five distinguished Fulbright alumni. And here in the room tonight are many more alumni and supporters who make the program the success that it is. As we celebrate this significant anniversary and the history of the Fulbright program, it's fitting also to consider the future. I am thrilled to highlight the creation of a new award recently added to the slate of Fulbright Ireland exchange programs. The Fulbright Commission in Ireland, in cooperation with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives Foundation, have created an award to honor the legacy of Frederick and Anna Douglass. This is inspired by the abolitionists' historic visit to Ireland in 1845, and the award will increase the diversity of those participating in U.S.-Irish exchanges, as well as focus on promoting social justice and civic engagement. In just a few moments, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Ken Morris, the founder of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and a descendant of Frederick Douglass, about how this program ensures the Douglass legacy lives on in Ireland today. This award that I've just mentioned highlights what the Fulbright program is all about, increasing mutual understanding through lived experience. Frederick Douglass traveled to Ireland in 1845 the far side of the Atlantic, and a place vastly different to his United States. His visit proved to be, in his own words, transformative. He arrived in Ireland as a spokesperson for the abolition movement, but by the time he left Ireland in early January 1846, he came to believe that the cause of the slave was the cause of the oppressed everywhere. Like the thousands of Fulbright exchanges that have added elements to our storied friendship, the relationships that were formed during Douglas's visit here have contributed to the shared history of both of our countries. Tonight, as we celebrate 75 years of the Fulbright program and the thousands of new US-Irish linkages that have been sparked through this wonderful exchange program, the word that comes to mind is the word that Frederick Douglass used, transformative. You, the transformed, are influencers in your professions, engaging the next generation of thought leaders in all of your fields. And tonight, I want to encourage you to keep innovating and keep inspiring, to continue using the Fulbright experience as a platform for progress, which pays dividends for the US-Irish relationship in countless arenas. Congratulations on Fulbright's first 75 years. It is indeed an honor to be part of this legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, you did mention the Frederick and Anna Douglas Award. We're very proud of this award uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, we're very interested in the social justice aspect. We're also very interested in recovering the name of uh, Anna Marie Douglas as well to that award. So. Uh, it's funny because I think public speaking is a, is a muscle that needs to be exercised now and then. And I think the next speaker, we're going to introduce um, Ken Morris, uh, who is um, actually, he's the great, great, great grandson of, of Frederick Douglass. And he's also, actually there might be an extra great in there, but he's also the great, uh, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. Hello and good evening from California. I'm Kenneth B. Morse Jr co-founder and president of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. We're a US-based nonprofit abolitionist and anti-racist organization with a mission to build strong children and to end systems of exploitation and oppression. My family and I are honored to be a part of this evening with you all to celebrate 75 years of the Fulbright program, 64 years of the Fulbright program in Ireland, and the inaugural year of the Fulbright Frederick and Anna Douglas Fellowship Award. I want to send our thanks to the U.S. State Department, the staff at the U.S. Embassy in Dublin, and Chargé d'Affaires Alexandra McKnight for their support of this award and for hosting this event. Thank you to the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, Minister Colin Brophy, and Irish Ambassador to the U.S. Dan Mulhall for their support as well. And thanks also to DCU President Dara Keogh for his support, and a special thank you to the Fulbright Commission in Ireland, its board, and Dr. Dara Fitzgerald. I'm honored to be joining you virtually to celebrate the first year of the Fulbright Frederick and Anna Douglas Fellowship Award 
established this year to commemorate the 175th anniversary of the journey that my great-great-great-grandfather Frederick Douglass made to Ireland. We are honored that Fulbright Ireland has created this war award to recognize the legacy of my great ancestors. We're thrilled that you are highlighting the story of the transformative four months Frederick Douglass spent on your beautiful island in 1845 and 1846. Frederick Douglass was changed by Ireland. The new experiences he had and his interaction with new people, new cultures, and new ideas along the way. One could argue that the course of American history was changed as a result as Douglas became an internationalist in thought and the champion of oppressed and marginalized peoples across the globe. We're particularly thrilled that this award also celebrates my great-great-great-grandmother, Anna Murray Douglas. We know that there would be no Frederick Douglas without his wife, Anna. She was her husband's steadfast partner in every endeavor. Like him, she was a fervent abolitionist and a radical freedom fighter in her own right. Her story highlights the fact that change makers working behind the scenes are just as critical to the success as those in the spotlight, something that the Fulbright certainly recognizes through a focus on creating a global culture of understanding, solidarity, collaboration, connection, and community. We know that both Anna and Frederick Douglass would be so encouraged and inspired by the self-motivation and drive of Fulbrighters. As a young enslaved boy in Baltimore, Maryland, Frederick Douglass sought ways to learn and gain an education any way he could, which was a dangerous proposition at a time when it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. We also know from Douglass's writings that he exchanged bread for reading lessons with poor white children in Baltimore. Many of these children were Irish. He writes that these Irish boys always questioned why he was a slave and were among the first to put the idea of seeking his freedom in his mind as well. So we could argue that Douglas was inspired by the Irish from a very young age. In turn, the Douglas family is inspired by Fulbrighters everywhere who, like Frederick Douglass, seek out their own educational opportunities and take the initiative to create chances to learn and educate all of us with their drive and determination. And so we celebrate the Fulbright program in Ireland and Fulbrighters everywhere. We are honored to help celebrate your achievements and to support this new award, encouraging a new generation of leaders and change makers inspired by the words and work of Frederick and Anna Douglas. Thank you very much. I don't know at which port he stood, what oar heard, inhaling mist and this saline film, a splicing to a point of no return for clarity a shuffling about decks. What's stolen for Van Diemen's land, Charleston? What of asylum granted, hope harbored with abandonment? The same pastel gale and silent boats, still frames and cove, Cape Coast. And familial fetters boring tie, float, lighting channels, Every port rang, calling, steadfast incitement, Boston, Liverpool. Once faith and mercy met the Irish Sea. What wonder could be felt in these new sails? Raised of foresight, heeding every crew's cause. And thank you also to Ken. Um, in creating an award like this, there are uh, often a lot of moving parts, in particular with this award. Um, the, the Douglas Family Foundation initiatives have been uh, excellent in, in their support in the early stages of putting together this award. Um, Kristen Leary, 
who, who was instrumental in creating a lot of the connections in the US, uh, the US Embassy uh, here as well, um, thanks very much for their drive as well. Um, Caroline Schroeder and uh, the Frederick Douglass Week um, have, have been a great support to us as well. So rather, there are a number of moving parts. Uh, the US side of the world, I should say a big thank you as well to um, the DCU President Dara Kyo, who's here with us tonight. Um, Dara, I think, came back and answered within four minutes to say, yes, we're absolutely delighted to um, to support this initiative and as any student coming over. So thank you, Dara, because those are kind of um, connections and uh, kind of can-do attitude that, that really makes these kind of awards happen. So thanks uh, to everybody involved in this award, and we really look forward to promoting it, both the Irish part of it and the US part of it uh, over the next couple of years. Um, it's also very important to us as well for our outreach in, in the US as well, uh, for our diversity aspect as well, to encourage people uh, who, who don't often think of applying to Fulbright or, or to Fulbright in Ireland to consider coming to the Commission. So uh, I'm personally very pleased with that award. Now, um, I should, uh, you know, everybody here understands that this is a, a it's a bi-national um, arrangement and from the other side of, of, of the coin we have the Irish government um, who are stalwart supporters of this program as well. I'm delighted to have here tonight Fergal who is the Director General for Ireland, U, uh, UK and America's Division of uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Fergal you're very welcome to come to uh, the podium and uh, just give the Irish view I guess of the Fulbright program. Thank you. Um, Sharjah McKnight, Alex, uh, distinguished commission board members uh, and distinguished Fulbright scholars, past, present and hopefully future. Uh, it's a really great pleasure, pleasure for me uh, to represent the Irish government here tonight. Um, I'm standing in for Colin Brophy, our Minister for the Diaspora, who unfortunately <coughs> couldn't be here. Um, but for us, for the Irish government, for the Department of Foreign Affairs, being associated with and supporting this program for many, many years, enduring support is, is of huge importance to us and an honour to be associated with such a, a prestigious award that really is of the highest standard. And I think when you think back to 1946 when Senator Fulbright had those thoughts around developing a program uh, that would you know, really strengthen the links and the relationship between the US and other peoples of the world and then on into 1957 when it was founded here in Ireland, um, it was an extraordinary commitment on the part of the US after the Second World War when it could have turned in on itself and, and you didn't. Your country did not turn in on itself. You embraced Europe through the Marshall Funds, through programs like Fulbright, through many other initiatives. You re-engaged and you helped rebuild Europe. And then, you know, when you think of Ireland in the 1950s, maybe we were somewhat closed in. Those kind of connections that were started with Fulbright and other initiatives President Kennedy coming here in 1963 really helped us open the doors on the world again. And it was a huge investment in the Irish-US relationship that we really appreciate then and we still appreciate it today. And I think you're all a product of, of this program and that relationship and those connections that are, mean so much to us. And for us, for our commitment going back over many years, when you think of, of some of our economic challenges over those 64 years, uh, we have been proud to support and be supportive of this program in good times and bad, uh, and it's an enduring commitment. Uh, I know today was, we spoke about it being about the past and the present, but it's also about the future of this program. And for us, and for the Irish government, and for civil servants, and for politicians, it's a really, really important program that means so, so much to us. Um, and it's so much more than just an educational exchange. It is about cultural exchange. It's about building relationships, building connections, building understanding, and in a sense, post-COVID, it's about rebuilding those connections again. It's so, so important to be here. We've, we've done all these kind of events on Zoom. They're fine, you know, they work, they worked. But, you know, I was just talking to Dara there just before the event started, and you could hear 100 conversations around the room. That's what it's about, uh, being together here, but also that's what this programme is about, making those connections. And, you know, I understand your lifers, that you can't get out, that once you're a Fulbright Scholar, that's it for life. Uh, but that's a very, very good thing, and it's a vision that we in Ireland share with the US, those, kind of, those connections that are so, so important to us. Um, and I think it's fair to talk about 2,000 participants over the lifetime of the Irish-US programme, and obviously more into the future, and this is just a small gathering. I believe we're going to hear later on from some very, very senior 
uh, alumni as well as some more junior and we're really looking forward to that because it is about that enduring relationship. It's also very, very uh, heartening uh, to see the new Frederick and Anna Douglas scholarship. Um, last year, as you all know, we, we celebrated the 175th anniversary of uh, Frederick Douglass's visit to Ireland. I actually, I read his diaries. I read it that last year when I was down in Kerry, down in um, Cahar Daniel, uh, the home of Daniel O'Connell. Um, and the resonances there uh, between that time in Ireland, how difficult it was heading into the famine, and Frederick Douglass in his, in his, in all his experience of hardship and brutality and slavery, could make the connections with, with other people going through difficulty. It was really, really quite something. And we hope it inspired him uh, as he inspired us. Uh, and I think it was really re important and reflective last year when we reflected on the anniversary and reflected on Black Lives Matter and reflected on those issues in the US. But we also started having conversations in Ireland around whether we're stepping up in that space. And for young Irish people of, of colour, people of colour, what's their experiences like today in Ireland? So in a sense, it's a, it's a really contemporary challenge and a really contemporary conversation. It's not about 175 years ago at all. It's about today and into the future. And, and we're hugely, um, we're hugely um, inspired by his experience and by that connection. And we're hugely supportive of that scholarship and including our own work with the, with the African American, Irish American diaspora network um, in, in the US and also in here. And it's again, it's a relationship and it's a program that we want to be very, very supportive of. Uh, in relation to the Irish-US uh, relationship, we saw it yesterday with the really successful and warm visit of Treasury Secretary Yellen. We saw it in the few words between the Taoiseach and, and President Biden at COP. There's real warmth to this relationship. It's not just about trade. The trade is impressive. Um, programs like this are impressive. But it's more than just all that. It's more than some of its parts. It's deep and it's enduring and it means so much to us. I don't know if some of you know, but my, my job in foreign affairs involves Northern Ireland issues, British-Irish issues, and then Irish-US issues. And I can tell you, and Alex knows this, that the most enjoyable and positive <laughs> part of my job <laughs> is the US dimension. Um, and it's always been very, very important to us. Obviously, it, was, it has been and continues to be hugely important in terms of peace on this island and that really, really strong support, going back all the way back to President Carter in 77, all the way through, uh, and it continues right up to this day, and it means an awful lot to us, and it means an awful lot to us that it's across the aisle in Washington, it's across the aisle at state level, it's President Reagan, it's President Biden, it's President Clinton, it's enduring, and it's really, really important to us, and we never take it for granted. We never take it for granted, that connection, and uh, we hope we'll get an opportunity in the next few years to welcome President Biden to our shores, um, we want it to be when masks are gone and COVID restrictions are gone, so it can be a really, really warm visit. But President Biden knows the welcome is there on the mat. Um, so to all of you here, um, uh, just I think it's really important to come together and mark 75 years of the programme and 64 years in this, in this, in this country. It's a really important uh, programme. It's important for those who come here and it's important for those of you who, who go and travel to the States. And it's really, really important to see expertise being valued again. There was a time there when expertise, education, knowledge, maybe was, uh, wasn't given the credit it deserved. I think through the last two years, we see the value of expertise. We see the value of knowledge and learning and relationships. And it's very, very important. It's important now and it's going to be important into the future. So look, just with those words, I want to, I want to thank uh, the, the Commission, the Board. We work very closely together. It's a very, very important relationship for us. And Fiona is our representative on the Board, Fiona Broderick. Uh, you do tireless work. Uh, you have a difficult job. You know, the calibre of the applications, the calibre of the levels and expressions of interest to, you know, work through all that and just to select those who, who are deserving and will make great value out of the program is, is, a, is a really important job, but it's important, it's a job you do really well year in, year out. Um, and likewise to, to Alex and the MC team, thank you for the warm welcome this evening, as always. Um, it's really great to be here. It's great to be here in person, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the show. So thank you very much.
Many thanks, Fergal. Uh, you used a great word there, resonance. I think many of the full riders, or probably all the full riders in this room, feel the, the resonance of the program and their participation in it. Um, and long may that continue. So, this is kind of my little bit, but really to say, as executive director, I, I tend to have a very broad view of, 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 of a lot of things going on. It's, it's, it's quite a busy job in a sense, um, and that has many responsibilities. Um, one happy responsibility tonight is really to express gratitude um, where it is very much merited. So thank you to the US Embassy and to the Department of Foreign Affairs for their enduring support. Sincere thanks also to the Fulbright Commission Board who freely give up their time and shoulder a lot of responsibility uh, on behalf of the Commission and on behalf of future Fulbrighters and existing Fulbrighters. My personal thanks as well to the Commission team, uh, Sonia McGuinness, Paula Melvin, um, uh, Emma Lockney and today Sarah West in particular. Sarah has stepped into the role to manage uh, the organisation of the entire day, guided by Emma and I think she's done a great job. I, I'd like to give her a little round of applause. So the Fulbright alumni family also who form the majority uh, of this event today uh, very much deserve our thanks you know, on an ongoing basis for their numerous contributions. This is a very strong community where alumni engage as reviewers, they engage as interviewers, university and institution ambassadors, D DEI panel members, alumni association members, um, and those taking part in our discussion pa panel today. And, and all of you in attendance, really, and watching, all keep the programme so active and relevant. Uh, if you've been quiet of late, don't worry, the door is still open, and uh, we're happy to, to re-engage with you where, where, uh, where and when that works for you. Thank you to institution presidents in attendance and indeed all of the higher education institutions in Ireland and the US that year in and year out support our programmes. Um, I, I already thanked uh, uh, Dara Kyo uh, for, uh, for his enthusiasm and collaboration on the Frederick and Anna Douglas Award. We have a fantastic cohort of sponsors uh, that support the programme every year. These partnerships make an enormous impact on the breadth and the stability of the program, and they also very much deserve our gratitude. So again, just a small uh, clap for two people. Thank you, everybody. So, as a commission, our primary goal is to create opportunities for future Fulbrighters uh, to experience living, working, and learning in Ireland or the USA. We often have to reflect and come back to that point because it is a key part of what we do and you get involved very much in the day to day but I always take time out and, and we do uh, across the Commission to just understand that responsibility. Uh, we constantly uh, return to assess this. A value that is very close to my heart uh, is diversity, equity and inclusion. We want to include all eligible applicants in the programme. We support those who might not otherwise be able to take up an award and we are building a Fulbright family that has much to say and represents the widest possible voices. Indeed, the Frederick and Anna Douglas Award are one such relevant initiative. All of these are very important to the vitality and the durability of the Fulbright program. Truly, they underpin our mission. I think if anybody has looked at our mission statement and our strategy, you will see that, uh, and are part of the thread that will weave a future for the Fulbright program over the next 75 years. We're addressing the recent norm, our spectre, as it currently stands, of social distancing, uh, by instead creating spaces to meet and showcase. Our upcoming new office space will allow us to better engage with Fulbrighters, craft opportunities to meet and showcase Fulbrighter achievements. We will also build our engagement with stakeholders in the wider Ireland-USA ecosystem. So we're very much going to have open doors, even with the spectre of social distancing, mindful of that, but not um, impacted by it, hopefully. And again, I'll talk more about, uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk more about that, that, those plans as they develop it, but I can say that we're very much looking forward to building this over the coming year. Um, I'm confident that it will also do much to help promote the engagement between Ireland and the US. With such a rich programme, there's so much more I could say, uh, but I think I'll leave some room for uh, the upcoming panel discussion. And on that note, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Diane Negra, the hard-working Chair of the Fulbright Commission in Ireland Board to make remarks and to moderate our panel discussion. She's a professor of film studies and screen culture at UCD and the author, editor, or co editor of 12 books. Diane's work in media, gender, and cultural studies has been widely influential. 
She is chair of the Royal Irish Academy Working Group on Culture and Heritage, an American academic trained at the University of Texas at Austin, and she has been based in the UK and Ireland since 2002. That's quite a long time, Diane. She was Fulbright Professor at the University of Gdansk in 1999 to 2000. So on that note, Diane, you're very welcome to take over from this point. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank our hosts in the US Embassy. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to gather in person in this beautiful space. Fulbright, of course, is associated with outstanding important research in the humanities, the social sciences, the physical sciences, and other fields. And so it seems to me very fitting to celebrate the 75th anniversary um, as we have the pleasure of doing so tonight. And uh, another thing, of course, that we're celebrating is the value and the importance of the Fulbright community in Ireland, most particularly. I know that, that you have seen uh, bios for our four panelists this evening uh, in the materials uh, preceding this event, so I'm only going to give brief introductions for each of the four. Uh, the furthest end of the panel, you have to imagine him there, I suppose, for the minute, that they'll come up shortly. Uh, Evan Garza is a 2021-2022 U.S. Fulbright Scholar to Ireland, a Washington, D.C.-based curator and writer. He's co-curator and artistic director of the 2021 Texas Biennial. His Fulbright research at the Irish Museum of Modern Art focuses on artists from art historically uh, underrepresented communities. And as a visiting research fellow at Trinity College Dublin, he's examining art historical parallels between contemporary global movements for racial and social justice and the history of Irish protest and civil unrest. Evan, I think you're living in an apartment at Emma, is that right? Yeah, very interesting. Um, that must be nice. Uh, <laughs> We also have Dr. Jean McCarthy, who is a lecturer in organizational behavior at the Kemi Business School, University of Limerick. And she is also the UL Fulbright Campus Ambassador. She was a 2012 Fulbright Scholar to Colorado State University. Very snowy, very cold. Um, her scholarly research centers on organizational attitudes and behavior, which promote a more inclusive and sustainable workplace. Thirdly, we have Dr. John O'Loughlin Kennedy. Uh, John was an Irish Fulbright Scholar at the University of California, Los Angeles from 1961 to 1962. In partnership with his late wife Kay, he started Ireland's first overseas development agency, Concern. That was in 1968. He also founded the Irish Refugee Council, and he's been honored uh, by IFA with its Medal of Honor and by the IUSA with its Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2018. His latest project is a book entitled The Curia is the Pope. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, John's granddaughter, Sophie O'Loughlin Kennedy, uh, is a UCD student, and she's here this evening. Kimberly Reyes is also on the panel this evening. She was a 2019 U.S. Fulbrighter um, at UCC. She is the author of two poetry collections and is currently working on two collections beyond those two, so it's a grand total of four uh, at the moment. So her nonfiction book of essays, Life During Wartime, won the 2018 Michael Rubin Book Award, uh, published and anthologized in numerous international outlets. Uh, Kimberly writes about identity, ecology, and sexuality, and she divides her time between Ireland, San Francisco, and New York City. It's my understanding as well, Kimberly, that you've recently been appointed to the Hollywood Foreign Press, which is very exciting, and you're currently based in Belfast. So with those brief, but, but I hope indicative introductions, I'd like to ask our four panelists to now join me on the dais. conversation from various different disciplinary uh, perspectives, which I'm really looking forward to, I must say. And the first thing that I wanted to touch on tonight, you know, because it's, it's a, a pretty commonplace observation, I think, that, that the positive dimensions of being a Fulbright scholar extend far beyond the experience itself, right? We, we throw around platitudes like life-changing, but they have some legitimacy behind them. And I'd really like to hear some of your reflections about the impacts 
uh, of your Fulbright Award, either as you're experiencing it now, as is the case um, I know with Evan, uh, or, or as, as you experienced it in, in the past, what were some of the key intellectual, professional, and creative benefits uh, that came up with for you, in, or that, you know, as you measure it over time, for those of you uh, who've completed the Fulbright in the past. Jean, I don't know if you wanted to start us off. Sure. Okay. Um, I would say that the Fulbright experience is probably the most, uh, the single most impactful experience on my career to date. Um, and I suppose, aside from becoming a mother, probably one of the most impactful experiences personally as well. Um, I was quite a, an early career academic. Um, I had just finished my PhD and I was a postdoctoral student when I received my Fulbright scholarship. Um, and I actually told this story at uh, the, the interview, but um, it was long before that that I first um, heard about the Fulbright programme. Um, I was very fortunate, a friend of mine when I was in primary school, her uh, father worked with the DFA and he was uh, in Geneva and they brought me over to visit them. It was my first time on a plane. Um, it was my first time outside of the British Isles. So, you know, it was quite a formative experience in many ways. Um, but we went on a tour of the UN and uh, somebody said, there is Boutrous, Boutrous Galley. It was about 1994, 95. And I said, being 11 years old, who's she? And everybody laughed. Um, so the, the following you know, hour was spent educating me about uh, uh, different things. Uh, and one of the things that came up was the Fulbright program. So I, it's something I've been thinking about for quite a long time. So when I went to Colorado State um, as a relatively early career academic, um, I think the big benefit that it gave me was confidence, or at least um, rather self-efficacy. Because I was a you know, junior, and all of a sudden I was at Colorado State University and people were calling me up saying, oh, you're the Fulbright Scholar, come over to my house, let's have a dinner, let's go to this event, would you like to be the guest of honour at this um, Colorado State function? Um, so it, it, it was probably the first time that I, 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 I suppose uh, felt, you know, I, I stepped out of that imposter syndrome that many of us um, experience. Um, and I learned a lot uh, about different things uh, at the time, it was the 2012 um, Barack Obama uh, second election. He came to Colorado State um, to speak on campus. I learned all about the Electoral College and how that worked. Um, but I just, you know, people championed my work and it opened so many doors for me and it continues to a decade later. So it's really nice to hear. John, I wonder if you might, from your perspective, also speak to some of these issues and how, over the course of your career, how Fulbright has maintained a sort of presence uh, for you. Could you speak to that a bit? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Well, the answer to that is life-changing. Uh, I, I grew up in the 40s and 50s, and uh, Ireland in those days was a somewhat insular island, if I may call it a phrase, uh, what hadn't been thought of by the church had been looked after by the state. And uh, who were you? It was impudent to have bright ideas. And uh, I went to California and, well, hard to say it in a few words, but I was bowled over. First of all, by the can-do attitude that I met. If you said something, if in UCLA, if you said something was impossible, you might be surrounded by four or five students who would say, can you say with authority that that's impossible? Because we'd like to do it. There'd be an MSc in that. Why don't there be a PhD in that? Tell us more. And, 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 and that, that was the attitude. And John F. Kennedy was in the White House and anything was possible. And uh, the other thing that impacted me was that uh, UCD, of which I have great respect, but UCD in the 50s was a sort of advanced secondary school where you were, where you were taught things <laughs> and where you certainly didn't disagree with the professor. And, uh, you know, I suddenly found myself impacted in C California by the fact that the university there taught you to ask questions. They didn't teach you answers, they taught you to ask questions. 
And frankly, if you could ask a question that would stump the professor, he was delighted. <laughs> you know, that, that was, that was the way they thought. And uh, uh, so you know, that impacted me immensely. Uh, I, I came home and seven or eight years, well, first of all, uh, Fulbright was a, a great uh, honour. And, and uh, so uh, Gareth Fitzgerald invited me to take over the Economist Intelligence Unit of Ireland, which he had been running because he wanted to get more involved in politics. And, and uh, so that was good for my career. And uh, it, it, it also gave me confidence. I had been seven years out of college when I got the Fulbright. So I can remember sitting in the library in UCLA, banging my head with my fists and thinking, God, I'll never learn anything out of a book again. Uh, but that problem lasted for about three weeks and I started learning and I became a student again. And I don't think I've ever stopped being a student since then. And uh, anyway, eight years later, there was a civil war in Nigeria where Biafra tried to break away and become a separate state. And it was fought by uh, an old fashioned blockade. There was no communications in or out. There was no food moving in or out. There were no people moving in or out. And um, the, the, uh, the, there was famine and famine developing. And uh, my brother nipped, got into, he was the first person non combatant to get in to Biafra over the, uh, the blockade. And he, he took a, fly, a seat on an arms flight at night into a secret jungle airstrip. airstrip. Anyway, out of that, Kay and I decided that something had to be done. We had to do something with people dying of famine. And we called a meeting in our house uh, to which we expected a dozen people to turn up and about 40 turned up. And that was the start of concern. And uh, we were either very, very lucky or we were guided by providence. Many of the decisions we made in the early days of concern, we made for good reasons and discovered afterwards why they were very good reasons that we didn't know about at the time we made the decisions. And I, I won't go into examples of that, but anyway, it can, we ran it for 10 years and then other people took over and uh, our organisational expert here beside me uh, will know that there are some people for starting things and other things for keeping things going. And, and when they grow to be big organisations, they have to become bureaucratic. And so they are not quite as adventurous. You know, when we couldn't charter a ship to go into the war zone, uh, we bought a ship and that sort of thing. And we didn't, we didn't need, I'm reminded of Robert Kennedy, uh, that, that if, if, if you're afraid of failure, you'll never get anything good done. Uh, we, we knew that it was worth trying to feed, feed famine affected people, even if our attempts didn't work. And so we try anything, and indeed most of them worked. And so uh, it not only has Fulbright affected my career and my whole life, uh, but, you know, last year, uh, Fulbright, uh, sorry, concern, uh, turned over uh, $200 million and had three and a half thousand people working for uh, uh, development projects, agriculture, medical, so on, in, in, in 25 of the world's poorest countries. And, uh, uh, you know, all, all that, there were many things came together to enable that to happen, but Fulbright was a major one. I would never have had the courage, or the arrogance, <laughs> to start it. If, if, if I hadn't had the full right experience. Thank you, John. So, Evan, I'm wondering.
wondering if by way of contrast, because as far as I'm aware, you've only been in Ireland for two months? No. For four weeks. Four weeks. <laughs> okay. So, and, you know, and, and you're coming from a very different position, obviously, but is it too soon for you to reflect a little bit on how Fulbright is impacting you, your work, your sense of self, the confidence that the first two panelists alluded to? Could you speak to that? No, I think, um, I mean, the, the impact has been um, immediate and, uh, and intense in, in the best possible way. Um, you know, being a Fulbrighter has just completely opened every possible door um, since I've arrived in Dublin. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my first month of a six month uh, scholarship and so I'm very much in a gathering place at the moment. Um, so meeting everyone that will have a pint or a cup of coffee with me, um, you know, learning about the collection at IMA, um, you know, teaching um, myself really about Irish culture, um, and it's been uh, truly an extraordinary experience so far. Um, you know, really learning about um, different contexts, political, historical, art historical, or otherwise. But uh, you know, every um, just mentioning either being introduced to someone as a Fulbrighter or um, you know being introduced to an artist as someone who's currently in residence at Emma. Um, has just uh, opened up the, the gates in terms of meeting other folks because um, meeting someone here will mean that I'm actually meeting five other people um, and they know someone who's working in an LGBTQ archive or who has materials related to um, you know, uh, protest history in Cork. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a million connections to be made. So uh, I noticed it right away as soon as I hit the ground. Yeah. So there are ways in which you arrive with a plan, but then that plan is already being modified. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's I'm I'm really very much in a in a gathering place. I was uh, uh, having a, a coffee today with a colleague at Trinity, and uh, I said I'm kind of in a squirrel mode at the moment. I'm I'm sort of gathering all of these little. It's the right season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. Exactly. It's uh, perfectly in line with uh, with autumn at the moment. Um, and then you know, as I as I you know get into uh, the Fulbright Scholarship a little bit more. I'll begin to, to crack some of those nuts and you know begin to make sense of <laughs> these contexts and these histories and put some of these pieces together. And um, you know the collection at the Irish Museum of Modern Art is so incredibly rich, uh, and it's a deeply feminist collection, um, which was a huge part of my attraction to to the collection. Um, and I've just been. Um, just unbelievably surprised by how well or how warmly my research interests, uh, my curatorial background, uh, my personal background have all been received, not only by my colleagues at Emma, but um, but just by Dubliners uh, in general. Oh, so good. Well, you know, I'm listening to you speak. I'm reminded too of just the incredible importance of these public assets like museums. For me, cinemas, right? I mean, the experience of not being able to go to, to a cinema for a period of months was like a, an enormous deprivation for me. And, uh, you know, I think that that feeling that you're describing through your work of getting back into museums and really engaging with collections and archives and the thrill of that is... It's really nice to hear. Hmm. Kimberly, could I call on you as well? And you guys too, I'm, I'm aware that, I think you're about, th uh, how many years post, post Fulbright are you, two? Two. Yeah, but could you maybe reflect a little bit on how Fulbright has reverberated for you? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it was transformative. Everything that I'm doing now is directly related to the grant. Um, I, Ireland's like the home of contemporary poetry film, and I studied at UCC Irish writing and film, and so it sort of set me up for the creative opportunities that I undertook while here. I had to be on the ground in Ireland for that to happen. Um, getting the literature bursary to have, for the first time in my life, like a year to actually write, I wouldn't have gotten that if I wasn't a Fulbrighter. Um, and obviously, even just the Hollywood Foreign Press thing, it was because I'd made so many relationships with presses here and had written so much that my application like went through. And you know, Thursday night, I get to go to the Belfast premiere and meet Jamie Dornan. And there's nothing more important than that, so. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> But now the Golden Globes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But Jamie Dornan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the question I also wanted to put to the group, you know, that really kind of um, focuses on the, you know, I wouldn't ask this question if we were in Portugal or Germany, but, but I, I'm really struck by the way that Ireland and America both tend to be places that a lot of people worldwide think they know before they've ever necessarily visited. 
And I'm wondering if you had any surprises in your Fulbright experience. In other words, were there things that you thought you knew about the culture into which you were immersed that needed to be revised? Um, and I know some of you were going one way, some of you were going the other, but is there anything that you particularly thought from a cultural standpoint, oh, this isn't quite what I expected? Jean, do you want to? Yeah, sure. I suppose I have experience on both sides and yeah. going to live at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains was certainly a new experience for me, having to deal with bears and mountain lions and <laughs> trying to explain that the most dangerous animal we have here is a bull or a cow, I suppose. Um, but uh, one of the things that struck me, I suppose, um, actually politically, uh, because at the time, as I said, the 2012 election was on, were all the, the college parties around the debates. And at the time, I wasn't very familiar with the VP debate and that it was a thing. And it was the first party that I was uh, invited to. And it was, uh, at the time, Vice President Joe Biden and Paul Ryan. And I remember people were like, wait till you see this guy, Joe Biden, he's going to eat Paul Ryan for breakfast. And there was this, you know, whole discourse and, and fun and interest around it. Um, and that was really the this, this starting point for me, making new friends and learning all about uh, you know, people's different views and how we can all still be friends but have different political views. So that was really interesting on the US side. But since I've had a lot of colleagues come to Ireland um, as a result of the full breakdown through the years, and um, when they come to the Kemi Business School, there's always a big talking point because our business school is called after Jim Kemi, who was a former mayor of Limerick, um, a parliamentarian, a socialist, a trade unionist. Um, and that's very much at odds with legacies of business schools in the US. Um, and this is always something that, that really generates, you know, ri a rich talking point around our, you know, real, I suppose, vision and purpose of making an impact and having a professional duty of care to our community. Um, and, and I think that that's always a lovely conversation to have, but it's certainly a surprise for a lot of my US colleagues who come from business schools in the US mm. to, to UL. Are there opportunities for you to proselytize that way of being a business school to others? Well, <laughs> um, actually one of the things that we're doing um, is working with Dara and everybody at the commission mm -hmm to um, try to establish what we believe will be the first Fulbright Social Innovation Lab um, linked with the Commission and the Kemi Business School, where we will seek to work with multiple stakeholders from policy making, social activists, community leaders, yeah. um, scientists, scholars to try and um, you know, you use those multi-stakeholder perspectives to come up with real solutions to a lot of the, not only environmental sustainability issues, but also the social and economic sustainability issues that have even heightened since the COVID crisis. So that's something we're, we're very much um, hoping to do and, and champion the Kemi legacy that way with Fulbright. Thanks. Evan, you were describing a few minutes ago a rather smooth process. Um, of adjustment to being here, but have there been any things that caught you a little off guard or anything that you thought, well, that's not quite what I thought Ireland would be? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this question, actually, as I've been sitting here, and I think as people of color, as queer people, I think we're constantly aware of our surroundings. Yeah. We're constantly um, sort of moving through the world, sort of negating um, ourselves, each other, um, asking ourselves if we are the only one around, or if we are going to be received in the way that we perceive ourselves. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, um, Ireland is a country that is roughly 96% white, and as, a, as coming from the United States, coming from America, you know, that number was, uh, was, was quite, you know, uh, uh, quite intimidating, I think, at first. Mm -hmm. um, the moment that I stepped foot on the ground here, um, my identity, my research interests, my curatorial interests, um, my interest in uh, politi political activism and social justice, um, all of it was just so incredibly um, well received. Um, there was a, there's a real appetite for learning about the culture of others, um, um, creating connections that are cross-cultural, cross-identity. Cross um, and I think I was, you know, again, coming from you know, being raised in the States. Um, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was prepared to feel intimidated, um, but instead, you know, very much like uh, the experience of, 
of uh, Frederick Douglass. I think he was himself was extremely surprised by how well he was received, how well his positions on abolition were received by the Irish people um, at the time. And um, it's been an extraordinary, uh, you know, incredibly eye-opening experience for me. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, the hopefulness of a cross-racial alliance it seems to arise from this. I would hope, anyway. But uh, yeah, no, that's, that's that's really great. Um, John, did did you want to also come in on this question? I I was struck in, in your earlier remarks about you know you mentioned in passing, but for me it was like a little you know kind of bomb going off. But you know Kennedy was in the White House when you were in, in the <laughs> United States. I just wonder if did you experience the United States as, as the place you thought it would be, or was it different? Well. Than- I had a lot of preconceptions about the United States because my parents arrived home from the United States about three weeks before I turned up. So my my mother made the Atlantic crossing and I was always glad that there wasn't a big storm. I might have been born on a Dutch ship and I wouldn't have wanted to be a Dutch man. I'd be happy to be an American or maybe an Irish man, but I had no ambitions to be a Dutch man. Uh, But anyway, uh, we had grown up as a somewhat Americanized family, uh, visually seen by the Stetson hat that my father always wore. And uh, so I didn't expect surprises, but there were one or two. First of all, I've mentioned uh, UCLA, where they taught you to ask questions rather than taught you answers. Um, The second one was that I was a pre-Vatican II Irish Catholic. And I met Jews in the United States in a way that I wouldn't have met them at home. And incredibly, of all the different kinds of people I met, the Jews were the ones that I felt philosophically most at home with. And that really surprised me as a 1950s Irish Catholic. Uh, the, the Second Vatican Council caught up a few years later uh, by changing the church's attitude towards Jews. And then uh, finally, the, in UCLA, they ran a thing called the Executive Programme, where presidents of colleges came on a Thursday at two o'clock and studied until eight o'clock and had dinner together and so on. And well, the first thing I learned was that people in America come up through the ranks in a very specialized way. If you come up through sales, you might be very good at sales. If you come up through marketing, you might be a genius at marketing. If you come up through accounts, Well, you you pay the wages, but you don't know anything about sales or marketing. So they come up, they are very good at their job, but very narrow and specialized. And then you get to be president of the company. And it's very embarrassing. You don't know anything about the design department. You know even less about accounts. So the executive program in UCLA brought together presidents once a week for this eight hours. And first of all, in the best Newman traditions, they learned from one another. And second of all, they got to know one another with a few boozy weekends up the mountains. (laughs) Uh, They got to know and relax with one another. And so they could tell, if if you've just been made president of a big company, you can't go around asking the staff, how to read a balance sheet. But as a salesperson, you've never read a balance sheet. And here, the part that we thought we owned is on the liability side. How the hell does that, that work out? But the, the attendees could ask the staff, look, we think we need a lecture on balance sheets, or we think we need a lecture on so, so on. And uh, that was great for them. It was also great for me to discover that the top people in these very large organizations are perfectly ordinary people and they have gaps in their background like everybody else. And that took away some of the fear. But it, 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 you know, it, it, it surprised me certainly uh, to discover 
that, that, that they had the weaknesses also and that they were ordinary people. And that has helped me a lot in my life because I, I was naturally a very shy person. Kimberly, I don't know, you, you strike me as somebody who you've lived in different places, you maintain a very kind of um, cosmopolitan identity, is my impression. Did you have surprises when you got here on the ground in Ireland, the things that you didn't expect? Um, I would say that I was happily validated that my hope was right yeah. about, like, there were so many misconceptions back in the States about Ireland. Um, actually, it's funny, um, when I was filling out my medical paperwork for Fulbright, I went to the doctor in San Francisco and he was kind of making small talk and he was like, oh, you must be going to Trinity to study creative writing. And I was like, well, no, I'm going to Cork. And he was like, but my ancestors left in destitute poverty. Like, why would anyone want to go there? <laughs> And I was just kind of like, you know, I've been looking for housing in Cork. It doesn't seem that different than San Francisco. <laughs> like, they have electricity now. Um, and so it's just even people who should really know better in the States just have this sort of like Angela Ashes, like, you know, this is like what Ireland is still like. Yeah. And then, you know, just also being, um, you know, a lot of my black friends in the States were just kind of like, what are you doing? Like, why would you not go to France? Or like, do you think you'll feel comfortable there? And you know, I just, I was always such a culture vulture and like, I just thought, well, I don't, like, I, I don't, I don't think it's fair to assign like the same attachment to whiteness that Irish Americans have that the Irish would have. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the music that I listen to and the films that I watch from like Neil Jordan to like you two, I was just like, I think you guys are underestimating like the power of colonization. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was, I mean, I came here and I'd felt you know, it's not as extreme as Frederick Douglass, obviously, but I did feel uh, like just a vacation from being a black woman in America. Right. Wow. Okay. So can I follow up maybe along with some of the lines that you kind of touched on there? Because, you know, obviously we are in a time in which racial identities in this country are being very actively expanded and complicated. And so, you know, sometimes this takes the form of recovering race histories, as is certainly the case around Frederick Douglass's visit. Um, but it's also a multifaceted phenomenon. And I, I do wonder if, in terms of the, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm sort of struck in your remarks, Kimberly, but is there perhaps a rigid adherence to a notion of what Irishness is in the States that has very much started to lag behind life in this country? Would that be a fair assessment, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. But on both sides, yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's, the, what's the flip side? The flip side is, I mean, like, I, I'm always struck by the number of, like, um, one third of people of chattel slavery have an Irish ancestry. Right. And we don't, that's not a conversation we ever have. And, you know, like, my, my father's Puerto Rican, so that's a separate thing. But my mother, every, like, she's of that ancestry. And, like, all of the surnames on that side of my family are Irish. And it's, like, it's just so weird that we don't have a conversation about, like, why that is and like how we're connected. Um, and so, yeah, I really hope um, that we start to like make those, just have those conversations, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you would hope that Fulbright might be a channel for some of this, right? That's the carrying back Absolutely. part of this, I would hope. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, that, that's also obviously we're, we're still um, thinking about these things very much this evening, but Fulbright stands out as an international program that largely continued its work during, you know, the, let's say the, the first year or so of, of the pandemic. And I'm wondering, and this is really a question um, for any of the panelists, but has your view of global engagement changed? Um, I'm, I'm just going to say after COVID-19, I'll be a little presumptuous, but, but at, at the time that we hope soon to be, when we can use that phrase with confidence, do you, do, as your view of, of global engagement, I, I think about, you know, um, the life I was privileged to lead before COVID, you know, where you're sort of you know, here one week and here another place. And, you know, things have changed in that regard, and there may be lots of thinking we want to do about global mobility for all kinds of reasons. You know, I'm mindful about you know the, the gathering in Scotland going on, but but do you think that? And I'm kind of using Fulbright as a bit of a jumping off point for this question, but are any of you thinking about global enga engagement differently coming as we hope out of the pandemic? I'd really be happy for anybody to take a question if it's something that interests you. Yeah, John, did you want to? Yeah, well, I think that COVID has taught us something. The Ebola pandemic that started in Africa was contained because everybody pulled together. And to an extent, the reaction to 
HIV, AIDS was was sort of world unanimous. People pitched in from all directions, and at least it's contained, if not cured. Uh, COVID, I would think, is a call to unity for humanity. And it parallels with what's going on in Glasgow at this very moment. If we can't learn from COVID and from, which is, and, and from climate change, which is long foreseen and now being felt, I, I'm tempted to, uh, to, to quote the, the uh, Benjamin Franklin's phrase about hanging together, or we will most certainly hang separately. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, that could be re, reset in a new situation if we don't learn how to work as nations in cooperation and respect for one another, then we will most certainly die together. And uh, I think that is, is what we should be thinking of after COVID. And very specifically, some years ago, the United Nations adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, negotiated by a very amazing Nigerian lady. And that is a world first, in a sense. Never before have 192 nations come together to make a commitment to helping one another and particularly to helping those who are least well off. And out of that you have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And actually there is progress being made. The, some, very, a lot of the commitments are being kept and there is real progress made on those 17 goals. And it seems to me that on this 75th birthday of Fulbright, that we would be totally in harmony with the Senator if all the Fulbright alumni associations around the world decided that they would push, publicize, report on and encourage the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The hard work's been done. The agreement is there on what the, it needs to be done. And uh, if the US government were to espouse it very strongly, then it would become a political thing. But if the Fulbright alumni who have just displayed such extraordinary public spirited attitudes would take that under its wing and push the 17 development goals, the commitment to it, the progress of it and so on, that that would be a rather splendid objective for the next 25 years. Sorry, the weight of John's remarks is kind of settling on me, but I, I just, um, it, it also leads me very naturally to, to the, the final question that I want to ask uh, the panel, which, it, which is, I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that concepts of public spiritedness and civic engagement seem to be losing ground to other value systems in America now. And yet a key raison d'etre of education is to enhance and inform the public sphere. So I, I'm wondering if, if, if all of you, hopefully, could briefly say something about what public service means to you in your professional and creative lives and how your Fulbright Fellowship relates to that. And Evan, I, I might go to you first, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, no, in my, in my case, um, you know, in the field of contemporary art and contemporary art history, um, you know, for me, public service has meant 
um, serving artists. Mm -hmm. um, and that's meant um, putting agency in the hands of artists and artist communities. But, you know, namely in my work specifically, that's meant um, trying to foreground the work of artists who, um, you know, by hook or by crook, have been sort of marginalized or left out of the art historical canon. Mm. And I find that um, through, um, through my work that uh, I'm trying to, to sort of fill in some of those gaps and essentially create space for artists who uh, have traditionally been left out, whether they are a gender minority or a racial minority, um, sexual minority, religious minority, um, broaden the art historical conversation um, so that we can be more inclusive. I mean, I think uh, it's no surprise to anyone that the nature of art history uh, and museum collections are such that, um, you know, that, that, that canon um, has essentially been written um, by um, Europeans. And I think uh, it's important that we, particularly now in a, as a global community, whether you know, post-COVID or not, I believe that um, it's, it's important for us to, to broaden that conversation. And so the nature of the work that I'm doing um, as part of my Fulbright uh, is, to, do, is to, to focus specifically on those artists, on those groups um, within the collection um, at the Irish Museum of Modern Art. Uh, and focus expressly on the work of those artists, the achievements of those artists, um, how IMA can continue to diversify its collection and its exhibitions and its programs, um, and how we can also um, shore up some of the, the, the strengths of the collection, um, which, are, which are many. Um, and then, you know, at Trinity, um, the work that I'm doing there is, uh, you know, really finding connections between this incredibly rich and tumultuous history of Irish protest history, um, rebellion movements, um, and find where there are connections to contemporary movements for racial and social justice like Black Lives Matter and Free Palestine. And there's a real, um, and there's real appetite for that work here. And so in, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of answering that question, I feel like it's, um, it's, it's uh, in terms of public service, it's, I really find that it's my work um, to, to lift up those voices and to, to put the focus there. And you find yourself here in Dublin at a time when there are very vivid debates about the artistic and cultural life of the city. I'm thinking about the very well attended protests around the cobblestone, things of that nature. So, yeah, in yeah. fact, um, I was uh, the first week that I was here, I was, um, I was having a, a doner kebab outside of Project Art Center. <laughs> and uh, I got a text from a, a new friend of mine here in Dublin. And um, they said, hey, there's a protest in Smithfield. <laughs> Uh, so I dropped the kebab, you know, <laughs> went across the Liffey, um, and uh, I arrived uh, in Smithfield. I mean, literally just as 4,000 plus Dubliners are marching along the Keys to Merchant's Arch. Um, and, I, you know, speaking with many of those Dubliners about, um, you know, the housing crisis. And um, there's a, there are a number of protest movements that are currently happening that I think um, I'm so pleased that I'm here while everything is open again, not just so that we can go have a, pu a pint, um, but so that people can gather again. And I think there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a richness to, to that. That's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here while that's taking place. Thanks for that. Jean, do you want to come in on this question as well? Sure. Um, I suppose, firstly, as an educator, I believe I have a professional duty and responsibility to um, ensure my students reach, reach their potential and I, I take teaching very very seriously and um, and I know that Fulbright you know it, it, it comes par for the course with Fulbright as well but um, and particularly in a business school when you think a lot of business graduates go on to you know become organizational leaders in, in for-profit large organizations but also in public policy and, and civil society so we have a huge responsibility in that sense and linking in with what John said around um, you know uh, training and developing people to be problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think, um, again, linking what John has just said, COVID has shown us that, that politicians and scientists and, and um, practitioners can work together to do big things and to solve large global problems. Um, and, and then I suppose beyond that, from a Fulbright perspective, we um, are in a very privileged position. We are given so many opportunities and every door is open to us. And I have seen that time and time again, just, you know, giving the name. So we need to use this platform 
for that problem solving as well and uh, that's that's the focus of my um, I suppose leadership and, and public service work right now. Thanks very much. Kimberly, I can see how public service is the heart of what you do on, on lots of levels, but could you speak to that question as well? Yeah, um, I think visibility is really important for me. Um, I mean, I'm still here. I haven't left. I didn't just put it on my resume and like skip town. Yeah, and um, you stayed here through COVID as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm a writer, so I think it's important to um, put myself out there. Mm -hmm. um, and also as an artist, I mean, I came into understanding political uh, structures because of art. Yeah. You know, that was my way in. And so I think I try really hard through my art to do the same thing, you yeah. know, whether it's poetry or poetry film or mm -hmm. my essays, you know, like however I can welcome people in that's not sort of like standing on a pedestal, right. I think is the best way to sort of make a difference. Yeah, creative practice as a form of public spirit, yep. spiritedness. Yeah, we could reinforce that a bit more. Yeah. Oh, thank you. John, did you want a last word on this question? Well, I wonder, is there any last word? Well, you're not obliged <laughs> to either, but I... I no, no, I, I, find, I find myself disagreeing with you a little bit in your opening point that the public service seemed to be fading a little bit in the United States. I'm not sure that that's true. And, I hope I'm and, wrong. I'd be pleased if I was wrong. Okay, but worldwide, it's not fading. Worldwide, it's improving. The, the, the whole world is improving. But to an extent, if you're on a ship and you climb up the mast, the further up you climb, the further the mast further up the mast you climb, the farther the horizon that you can see. But also, the greater the area that's just outside your reach. And as standards improve, people's ideas of what the standard should be go up. So, you know, one of the reasons we have a housing crisis in this country is that we have to build decent houses for people. Uh, you know, we, 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 could, we could house everybody by building hovels, you know. Uh, the, the world is improving. We no longer, at least the civilised part of the world, we no longer mutilate people by way of punishment. We no longer, even the British, don't send people <laughs> to... <laughs> don't send people to... Van Diemen's land, you know? When there was a ship called the Telecherry waiting in Cork Harbour, there was a memo sent out to the magistrates around Ireland to please condemn more people to transportation uh, because if they didn't fill the Telecherry soon, they would miss the trade winds to Australia. And so people, this was taken into account when you were being sentenced for sheep stealing or whatever it was. We don't do that anymore. I've mentioned the sustainable development goals. You know, our standards are improving all the time. Even at personal level, a hundred years ago, uh, my uncle could quote Dean Swift when he was talking to Terry Trench and say, what would you expect to get out of a trench except dirt? Uh, that, that sort of statement would not be acceptable now. We treat people with more respect and, and so on. So I, I think that as th the situation improves, our ambitions uh, improve also. And I, I, th I, I think it's quite evident, it doesn't need stressing, that, that the Fulbright organisation has gathered that as part of the extraordinary humanity of Senator Fulbright, which seems to have uh, permeated the, the whole organisation, even though it was, it was an origin, it's originally an educational project, it has this, uh, this, this sense of F F Fulbright's values. And, and so uh, I, I, I'm very hopeful uh, uh, that we can, uh, in, you know, continue to improve. I'm about to give the floor back to Dara, but before I do, I hope you'll join me in thanking these four wonderful panelists. <laughs>
My Fulbright Award involves undertaking a master's in international human rights law here in Notre Dame with a specific interest in human trafficking as well as the overrepresentation of minority groups in the prison population worldwide. I think it's absolutely incredible that technology allows us to connect via screens, but I think when there's a face-to-face -face element to it, it is such a blessing to be able to collaborate more with people. And I think the face-to-face -face element, which is so much more important in today's world, allows us to actually develop better empathy with one another. Thank you. I can honestly say that Fulbright was the best experience of my life. I got to make friends from all over the world, people I would have never had the opportunity to engage with. I'm still in contact with many of these people today, and I also got to learn under leaders in the field. To me, Fulbright is still as important as it was 75 years ago in terms of the cultural exchange aspect. Meeting people is what really made my Fulbright. Now I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the National University of Ireland, Galway, where I continue to collaborate with MIT and US partners. Hey, I'm Laura Marshall Clark, a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, a tribe in Oklahoma, and a 2021 Fulbright US scholar to Ireland. I've come as an interdisciplinary scholar, writer, and independent curator teaching Native American literature at the University College Cork. I'm also researching Celtic culture and identity for literary work and process. One of the greatest joys is to be here in person with UCC students and incredible faculty. As my students have learned in class through Native American history, culture, and tribalography, our lives depend on connection with one another. I know this, that I've not only brought my culture to Ireland, but I'm bringing Ireland home with me. The Fulbright experience opens doors to relationship and connection that change us forever. My interest in inclusive education and universal design for learning has brought me to Boston to work with colleagues in both Boston College and CAST where universal design for learning was designed to explore system requirements to authentically enact universal design for learning in the Irish context. This has been an invaluable experience for me, as not only do I get to work with my host professor Richard Jackson, but I also get to have conversations both formally and informally with other colleagues in both Boston College and CAST. This informal face-to-face -face is something that I would not be able to do if this was a virtual ex exchange. Bringing this home to my job with the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment in Ireland means that I will bring new insight into inclusion and diversity and the use of UDL as we continue to move towards inclusive education and diversity in Ireland. One of the great strengths of the Fulbright programme is the power of making in-person connections, which is something I very much value. For me, those connections were professional with university faculty and my fellow PhD students, cultural in terms of experiencing and embracing life in the US as fully as possible, and social, simply hanging out with the friends I made to solve the world's problems. In many ways, I can't imagine Fulbright without that cultural and social dimension. Since my return home to Ireland, I've been sharing the fruits of my time in the US with family, friends, colleagues and students, and in giving back to Fulbright itself through my engagement with the Irish Fulbright Alumni Association, where I served as president, and my service on the board of the Ireland US Fulbright Commission. And I've continued to benefit from and build on the links I made while in the US through professional collaborations and serving in leadership roles with the US Academy of Management. All in all, and to paraphrase Robert Frost, I credit my Fulbright experience with affording me the opportunity to travel a path in life that has made all the difference. Since returning to the US, I've been working on my PhD at University of California, Irvine, um, where I'm focusing on queer migrant literature in Britain, France, and Ireland. Um, and my connections in both Irish language world and the queer community in Ireland have been invaluable in my academic work since returning. My UL project for my Fulbright was my book, while well, finishing my book, uh, Moslandia, Morrissey Fans in the Borderlands, about Chicano and Latino in Los Angeles-based uh, subcultures of Morrissey and Smith's fandom. Morrissey is a second-generation Irish singer. It made sense to go to Ireland and study with these colleagues at UL to help me contextualize and, and bring these kinds of transnational uh, connections to understanding this subcultural phenomenon. Um, I continue to do work with these colleagues and have since published at least two more essays about football and about pop music and continue to nurture these research ties even while home in Los Angeles. I continue to serve the Fulbright Commission by um, 
appearing on panels for diversity and uh, inclusion, as well as LGBT uh, Fulbright PRISM activities. And I also talk about the Fulbright wherever I go, as an instructor in my classroom, as a writer for the award-winning LA Taco, where I get to talk about Los Angeles and their transnational ties to Ireland. And all this was made possible by the incredible in-person experience I had. Happy 75th anniversary, Fulbright. The Fulbright program for me was a major turning point in my scientific career, but also personally, it was a major turning point um, for me, the individual. I believe that Fulbright delivered way beyond any expectation or commentary relating to what Fulbright claims to offer in terms of exchange of ideas, in terms of collaboration, but in terms of developing oneself in the context of research and delivering on research goals. Without the Fulbright, I know we would not have been able to deliver the many major outputs which we have been so gratefully able to achieve in our field of science today. Thank you. Agus Hamish Blian America Simlian Hobbit the Kahitig, which he called the Kuitig, Agus May a Gobwit Mar, Hagus Boj, FLTA, no foreign language teaching assistant, and Legoike in Old School Villanova, Park Garg of Philadelphia. We in Vlinch and Harva Tauchta from Marwine, and Horme Ahne Roch Nua, Agus Ruina Nua, I know Agus May America and Kedoid, Ah, Homalas and Horme Anni Sarm Hain, Agus. Er, <laughs> 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 <la